we'll open up the floor and who would like to start with the first question for behind you. Kevin Tidy from uh, Bracknell Forest Council. Um, so the most important question is, which of the four tarmac methods is the winner? <laughs> so that's all for Taylor, Wimpy and Lester. Which one should we use? Or have they all got different? We've only tried one so far. Uh, there's still three to go, so we've only tried the two uh, hand-laid methods. But keep your eye out for our design guide and I'm sure you'll find out. Hi, I'm Wilhelmina from London Borough of Bexley. Um, a couple of questions. The first one to Jake and Barry, really. What do you see as the key skills for those people that are approving or looking at these plans and, and forming the SAB role? And then the second one is to everyone. I think everybody said how important it is for the concept drainage design up front. How do we convince and influence all developers to take that approach and make sure that is the first thing that's looked at instead of the layouts? Um, answer, answer to the first question, key skills needed. Um, I think people skills are just as important as the actual technical knowledge that you're gonna need. You need to be able to deal with a variety of people um, on site, off site, professionally over email. So that's really important. And then obviously you're gonna need some sort of basic knowledge about the principles of sustainable drainage. Um, obviously I did all my dissertation on sustainable drainage, so I've got that background knowledge, but there are a lot of courses out there that Siri are, are doing that should be sufficient. And the other question. Good question, first of all. Um, all the way through our presentation, we firmly believe that the success of this site is down to the conceptual drainage strategy and the way that we all spoke um, together. And I think there was a sort of riding um, fear that if we didn't get that right when we submitted for planning, it could have caught us later. So I think really it's hammering home that fact that you don't want any surprises later on. Is that okay? Um, so I think as well, uh, that I think um, developers can be encouraged to make sure that we have a, um, an influence on what we submit by, um, if, um, I'm not sure if anyone here is from the planning authority side, but if there's an outline consent that goes in, then clearly some of you will be consultees in that process. And I think it, I would encourage you as consultees to make sure that you look at the, um, the flood risk assessments that are coming through, check the design and access statements, and then look at what the conceptual um, uh, proposals are in, for, 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 for that particular development. And then, if, if you like, through the planning process, sort of influence as consultees that you want, you know, you, what, what, what we're looking for in terms of the design. So it's sort of almost... Uh, a sort of reverse process and sort of coming back to the developer and saying, well, through the planning process, we require this scheme to be um, based on the SUDS principles. Work with each other and keep an open mind. Don't get boxed in by technicalities. Think your way through it. Work with the developers and you'll end up with a good site. I think just to, to round that off, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, the, the other uh, sort of aspect that's probably um, missing from, from this talk is, is the master planners themselves and get them engaged in the process. Um, some, some are a lot better than others um, and quite often they lead the concept and the vision behind the master plan. So it encouraged them to get uh, on that basis. And I think Great Western Park is probably an example of where the the outline concept and the flood risk assessments was lost a little bit in the translation to the detailed planning applications. I would agree there. Um, to look at something better, you need to look at Southwest Vista, which is um, under construction, and then in next year is the Eco Town in Vista. Well, we hope we've got it right, and it, it will follow and flow nicely. 
Uh, Graham Fairhurst, I'm an independent consultant. I'm uh, chair of the uh, Sustrain uh, uh, Project Steering Group. Uh, I've got, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the speakers. I think we've had some excellent presentations, and in particular, I would like to um, uh, congratulate Taylor, um, Taylor Wimpy uh, for being uh, so positive and proactive in their approach to this. Uh, I think it's, uh, I feel we are actually now beginning to move forward now as um, uh, stakeholders in this whole business where we, uh, we in, in the past I think we've had a lot of momentum from the um, uh, environment agency side, the uh, local authority side and the house builders um, have perhaps been a little bit more reticent but it is um, very refreshing and encouraging to see uh, a major builder uh, like Taylor Wimpy taking such a positive and proactive stance. Uh, so congratulations there. But. In terms of questions, uh, I've got a couple. They're a little bit possibly nitpicky and detaily, but I, I hope you're able to answer them. The first one is the, um, uh, everyone has said that the early engagement is important and the pre-application meeting was used in the Leicestershire example uh, as a way of getting um, uh, the show on the road really there. Um, was that pre-application meeting really convened by the planning authority as a standard pre-application meeting and the, um, the SUDs factored into it. Uh, my other question um, is source control. Um, was any source control considered within the actual housing plots themselves, uh, either at um, the Oxfordshire or the Leicestershire uh, side? Um, and the final question is, could you confirm that the uh, exceedance has been taken into account in the designs um, in terms of the SUDS management train, uh, does that take account of uh, the flood route exceedance? Um, the, the, the first question then was the pre-application meeting. Um, was that, could you repeat that question, sorry? Yeah, was the uh, pre-application meeting, was it uh, essentially one that the planning officer convened as they would normally have had a pre-application meeting and SUDS factored into it? Or did the SAB uh, take it as a, a pre-SUDS uh, pre uh, application meeting? Yeah, no, it was actually Taylor Wimpy East Midlands approached us, uh, me and the infrastructure planning team and asked for, us, uh, for, for an hour or so of our time to discuss a, a greenfield site and a drainage strategy. I think they wanted the confidence that we would adopt their features and therefore they wanted us in at a really early stage to discuss the strategy, where the water would go, where it would be stored, the layout and everything followed after that. Just to add on to that, um, as soon as we saw the outline conditions and we knew that we had to um, produce a sustainable development. Um, with the experience that we received on the recent few jobs where we'd gone down a traditional 104 route, large pipes, and then had a horrendous battle um, with the water authority at the end, um, we knew that we had to do something different um, on, on the previous site to this one. Fortunately for us, Leicestershire County Council rode in uh, and took a pond at the end of the development for us, which allowed us then to get our 104 in place because we had a public body to take over that pond. Without their help, we would have struggled. And we, we didn't want to rely on that help again for the next site because we didn't believe it was going to be forthcoming. Therefore, we embraced the SUDS and we went for it. So we actually engaged with LCC and we sat down and said, right, how are we going to tick this condition and how are we going to develop a SUDS-based site? And to answer your question on exceedance, yes, it was 100 year plus 30 with no flooding. As you may have gathered, I've dealt with a number of very large scale sites in Oxfordshire. Um, the Eco Town is going to be 5,000, Didcot Street, three, uh, Grove Airfields, two and a half, um, West Whitney's, 1,500. In all the cases, we made sure that we had a pre-meeting with the master planners and the developers and then use that master planning meeting to break down into the elements that the planners wanted to see, what the house builders wanted to see and what we wanted to see in highways and suds. It all boiled down to that master plan, getting it down there. Exceedance flow, yes. 
I made sure that uh, the Section 38 team have it on their tick list. Is you check your calculations, you do check it all, and then you look for your overland flow route. And don't put it past a junior school, don't put it past an old people's home. Make sure it's somewhere safe and get it registered with the SAB authority. In, this ca in Oxfordshire's case, it's with Gordon Hunt. It's registered with him. He's got it on his database. Thank you. I think there was just one last bit about source control as well, you were talking about. Um, I mean, certainly on the Great Western Park, we had the issue with the perceived infiltration rates available in the upper green sand that turned out not to be quite so um, permeable. Um, what we did with that is we, we had the concept that we would provide soakaways and allow the permeable paving to be permeable at the base, but we would have to incorporate, in effect, um, exceedance pathways outside of all of those features. So even though we had soakaways, they all had overflows that linked to the main network. Um, the permeable paving was all linked to the main network so that it could over, over top or um, fill up and then flow to a different area of the site. Um, also the green fingers and the landscaping, the strategic landscaping was done in such a way that even if all of those were overwhelmed, the ultimate exceedance route would follow the landscape uh, and in fact follow the old routes of the uh, watercourses that they had before that. Can I actually ask a, ask a question? Uh, thanks for the presentation, really, really good. Uh, I keep on having a discussion with developers about the benefit of SUDS in terms of uh, pond premiums and premiums for uh, uh, houses that overlook SUDS features. Are you selling your properties at a premium that overlooks SUDS features or will you be doing that on other developments? I did, do, whilst, whilst the punters are interested in the schemes, are they willing to pay more for them? We, we've, certainly, we've certainly got an interest in um, those, those homes that overlook the features and the planting. And in answer to your question, we will try and maximise the revenues wherever possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, if, if if there's a perceived value, then while we can, we will we will try and um, we will try and sort of recover that. Um, for you, you have to sort of balance that against the the whole site, um, you know, whole site revenue and and the cost. Um, so it, it it's a huge balancing thing. You can't you can't sort of say, oh well, those five houses are going to be ten percent extra, therefore, because some of the middle plots which are more sort of condensed and don't have the same amenity might have a, you know, a negative value. So it, it, it's a bit swings and rounds about it to sort of coin a phrase, but in answer to your question, yes, we would try and, we would try and recover additional value on those homes. I'm not gonna answer your question, <laughs> Paul. I'm going back to the previous question, which was asked about on plot. At the eco town, as one would expect, we have said we are looking for rainwater harvesting, both for the washing machine, it loos, both for the gardens, etc. It has been accepted. The Simmon homes at Grove Airfield have also accepted that they will put harvesting systems in. It has always been one of my things for many years to keep asking for it and it's actually now being achieved. Because it does take off up, to, I think, 20% of the load per day. Yeah, yeah, come here first, and then there's one to your right, and there's one behind you, and there's a lady over there. Yeah, hi, I'm Neville Stebbing, Countryside uh, Properties. I'd like to revert back a couple of questions to the point that was being made about uh, the uh, the master plan and in particular two things struck me about the presentation uh, firstly I think um, Jake one of your lessons learned was the proximity of the swale I think to a ditch uh, and, and secondly I picked up on I think it was either I think it was you Chris who mentioned about the blobby plan um, and then there was further mention about master planning when we 
very often on large schemes, when you start master planning, we talk about landscape led master plans, that is to say, picking up on existing features, ditches, ponds, etc. I wonder how much in your lobby plan did you pick up on the existing ponds? And, and perhaps you'd like to comment on the, uh, dare I say, the obvious synergy between the ecology, great crested news, often viewed <laughs> as a nuisance, but if you can keep the ponds and make them part of a sustainable drainage system, uh, there's an opportunity there, I think, for informing your lobby plan. Well, I, I, can, I can just mention a little, little bit. Um, on the Great Western Park, um, water voles were identified fairly early on as actually occupying the highway ditch that ran alongside the A4130 at the top, top end. Um, I think somebody stated it was one of the most expensive water vole because yes. there was only one ever found. Um, <laughs> and I think the, the, the developer, I think, ended up paying about £150,000 in order to... Uh, uh, reorganised the way the uh, entrance was constructed and also the phasing. We had to allow a year for um, the vegetation to establish before we could install a culvert. Um, but yes, there, there, there should be a synergy between all of those, but there is also the competing um, ideas from tree preservation and ecology, etc. Yes, this thing of the landscape-led master plan it is important that the existing landscape is not negated, but you work with it. As Chris said, at Bidcot, we've used the old fence routes and old tree lines and hedges as the exceedance flow final routes. But we've also enhanced it by putting um, swale and ditches beside them, similar to Jake at Leicester, but trying to get them very close together so that you don't lose land, but you recognise the importance of the existing landscape. Um, sorry, what, what did you say your name was again, sorry? Um, Neville, sorry. Um, w when we first considered the blobby plan, we were looking at the proposed drainage features, but also the existing outfalls and the way that we could incorporate the two. Um, this is this is not by far the finished article, and we've not got all the answers with this. It's, it's a good step forward, and a lesson learned. We will most definitely be incorporating the landscaping around the table and on the shot that I showed you to get those views to bring that in early on so that um, you know we don't have the issues of being two meters off a, a hedge when really we could make that feature better by pushing it over so we're not there yet um, but it's a good point and it's something that we're looking at doing. Um, Anthony McCloy, Sods Designer. Um, just a quick confession, I've already been up with these guys walking around the site, so I might have a bit more of an insight. Um, one thing that does strike me, and it's mentioned within your presentations, um, the point of collection, particularly from the housing plots and the roofs, etc., from the downpipes, that's connected into a pipe within the French drain. That obviously dictates the depth of the drainage at that point. Our tailor won't be looking at any other variations on that detail to keep water on the surface. Yeah, thank you. I think that it, it's a similar question to the um, dealing with the um, the water at source, um, and are we dealing with it at, at point of collection? And um, um, hand on heart, we. Um, we, we, we're trying to avoid um, rainwater harvesting at the moment, Barry, because it's, it's a difficult concept and, a, and, and an expensive concept for us to put in. 
But what we are looking at is trying to put the, um, the water from the downwater pipes into the permeable mat and then use that as a storage stroke filter material, um, which is then conveyed to the, the, the swales rather than piping it to, to, to the swales, which we did at Grangewood Manor. And I think that would also increase the, um, you, you know, the treatment train um, and, um, and, and, and the storage of the water, slowing it, slowing it down as we go forward. Um, we've got that on three projects now, I think, as we're, that we're looking at. Yes, we, uh, in Oxfordshire, we've been allowing roof water into the drainage system, the suds drainage system. Um, where we've got street and block, it goes into the filter media under the porous paved road, so we don't have the level difference you're talking about. And as Chris has said, you keep it nice and high and flow it off into your other source control methods. Sorry, Katodorovic from Atkins, but seconded to Manchester City Council uh, and dealing with sub uh, duties as well. So we have the similar uh, situation uh, trying to adopt the SADs for, uh, uh, you know, for the, uh, in the public spaces, but also some of the sites rely on uh, uh, source control and potentially uh, on soakaways at the plot level. So I was just thinking uh, for the elements which we are adopting in the public spaces, we will put them on the asset register and they will be part of the maintenance and inspection regimes. Did you think about, uh, uh, you know, how would you, will you designate or how would you deal with the uh, such elements which will be on the individual plots and just to make sure that basically the whole site which relies on, uh, uh, on basically functionality of those, of those such elements have been picked up as well? So yes. I wanted your, <laughs> you know, your view on this one because we are just in the process of doing the same thing. Um, it's unfortunate that um, a Carl from MJA couldn't get, be here today because he would explain the parcel drainage system at the Great Western Park where we've got more than one house connected to a SUD system. We check it and approve it and inspect it and there is a small amount of money gathered for maintenance. In checking it, we make sure that whatever system is put in is get atable. Um, we try to do it so that you can get at it from two ends. If it runs in the back gardens of blocks and that, make sure that there's a, uh, an inspection chamber at one end and the other end and that we can maintain it from those directions without going into the people's gardens and having um, covenants over um, their land. Hash Patel uh, from uh, London Borough Brand. Uh, I've seen uh, many, many examples on these uh, such schemes. Uh, they're all sort of based in uh, of London in sort of uh, rural areas. Uh, this question is in sort of two part, probably more for the developers. Uh, London, or probably sort of the brand, is so densely populated with a very, very limited space for developments. There are plots which are available. My question, first question is, uh, Wimpy Taylor, have, are you sort of looking at any sites in, uh, in these sort of areas? And uh, would it work out economical in terms of landscape, uh, land take up and the cost? Would it be sort of make it worthwhile for the developers to do some those sort of schemes in London areas? I'll open the answer back up. Um, we have one or two very, very dense population areas like in Southwest Bista, in Great Western Park, because of the density plans formed in the master plan. In those areas, as said, where we have street and block and we've got basically a very narrow verge by the house windows, then a, pa a path, a road, a path, a little edge, all that drains into that sub system that is usually the road and then flows on down. So it works in very, very dense areas. 
So there's no worries about that. It's just making sure that where it goes off to can cope with it. Hi. Um, at Taylor Wimpy, we're looking at each site on a site-by-site -site basis. I don't think there's one fits-all method for SUDS on every single site. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about working very closely with your future SAB and finding out what they're going to want on that specific site to achieve your consent. Okay? And I think that if you know, if you take this upfront dialogue and you know what SUDS you're going to be incorporating into your schemes, you can then work out whether it's going to be viable or not. I think that's the key. Neil McLean, MWH. Um, I have a question for Chris, and it's probably relevant for uh, Grangewood Manor as well, and I'm sure Barry will have an opinion on it too. <laughs> um, Chris, you mentioned that um, for the site you were dealing with, there was 35 hectares, if I've got my sums right, um, for uh, open space. Um, people have understandings and definitions of what open space is, whether it's public open space, publicly accessible open space. And I wonder if you have any opinion on whether a, a pond, for example, is publicly accessible open space, and indeed um, bring that down to the opposite end, a, a very narrow service strip or a swale, could, could that be counted the open space as well? Yeah, uh, as you say, I think Barry has a few, yes, got a few opinions on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the, in, especially in the Great Western Park, there was, there was kind of three uh, levels of open space. There was the formal public open space, then there was the informal open space, which is generally where the ponds ended up. Um, it was accessible, um, but not um, taken on as, as formal open space, so it wasn't landscaped to the same degree as some of the other areas where it was a bit more uh, left to meadowland and um, bound by woodland, etc. There were requirements from Oxfordshire for access, maintenance, routes, in and out of those kind of features. Um, but yeah, there were some constraints on introducing fences and, and some barriers to almost, to start with, just demarcate the different areas. Um, but, um, and there was another level, which was the urban public open space, which is a, a, a different one, which is much more hard landscaped. Um, I think it, w it was, at the time of doing the Great Western Park, the multi-use of, of the open space areas was really more a landscaping, uh, uh, dual use landscaping and suds, rather than make them use as a football pitch or uh, any of those kind of multi-uses. So we didn't really develop them in that kind of um, manner, but I think that's something that's kind of come forward. Yes, as Chris was saying, there is a very formal, it was called the Oval, um, which is formal pitches, the changing rooms, tennis courts off to one side. That was very, very formal and specific sports related. There are then pocket parks, which are one degree down, and then you go off into the more rural areas where there's cycle tracks, fitness ra tracks, and as Chris said, around the ponds, because we wanted access, to be able to maintain the ponds, these access ways do form walkways because we kept them very, very rural. Um, using something like bod, bod pave or the plastic grids filled up and then grassed over. I think just, just to add to that, I mentioned in our presentation that we're um, holding working groups with the developer and we're also hold, holding them with the local planning authority and one of the work streams in that what we're trying to trying to get across to the local planning authority is that suds if they're designed correctly are multifunctional spaces if they're shallow if they're dry for you know 99% of the year why can that not be considered as POS if it's absolutely raining cats and dogs outside you're not going to want to be outside anyway and that's when the features turn into drainage features so I think it's all about designing a multifunctional area. It's just, it's just came to my mind, on the eco-town, the requirement was for 40% open space. 
10% which had to be within the gardens. So although it's uh, open space, it wasn't available to the public at large. So it, it depends on the site. Um, yes, I want, had a question probably for Jake, maybe for Steve. Um, we've all heard all about the flows, you've ticked the boxes there. Did you consider volume? If you probably, I guess, Oxford didn't because it was a while ago, but if you're thinking towards the Flood and Water Management Act, I wondered if you were thinking along the lines of the DEFRA uh, draft national standards. So considering volume. Good question. <laughs> Good question. One. It's a very <laughs> difficult one. Oh, I've got the mark. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, flows, yes, we considered. We, you're quite right. We ticked the discharge rate. We obviously engaged with the environment agency, showed them the impermeable areas. They had the calcs. They knew exactly what was going off. Are you talking more about complying, as in, the volume that you're putting off is more now than what was existing. Yes. Um, I think that unless you start to incorporate rainwater harvesting -y type, dare we say, features, unless you've got soakaways on your site, you're always going to push off more. I think that's a fair assessment. But I think it boils down to if the Environment Agency are happy, LCC are happy, you've considered everything else, not a lot really more you can do. Uh, yeah, that probably won't be an answer, will it, at the end of the day? Again, it comes down to working with the landscape people because obviously science works for transpiration, soakage, etc. If you get the planting regime right, the amount of air you've got, you are going to decrease the volume. But you've got to get all these systems working together. Obviously, <laughs> in a period like we've just had, nothing works. That is something you've got to think about and have this overflow routes available. But this again coming down, work as a whole team, holistic approach, everyone, and you'll achieve it. One last one at the back, and then Paul, you can ask a question. <laughs> um. <coughs> Just uh, following on from the last point there, made about the volume, uh, just to uh, spend quite a bit of time over the last number of years trying to get my head around long-term storage, volume, etc. In the original draft standards that were produced in 2011, it was a lot clearer laid out. Uh, essentially, there's two methodologies for restricting flow rate, um, down to Q-bar or mimicking the Greenfield runoff curve. You guys brought everything back down to Q-bar, which means things hang around a lot longer, things take a lot longer to drain down, and you will disperse and dispose of more water. Um, so to that extent, I would say you actually met your objectives. That's a pat in the back. <laughs> That's the last question of the day. Thanks. And we will be having a fact <laughs> We'll be having a fact sheet on that in a way coming out soon for SOSDRAIN, but the, the query I have is, obviously the last uh, couple of months, our, our focus has really been on on flooding, and I'm just wondering, with regards to water quality, I mean, it's questions for Chris Patmore, Chris and, and Steve, really. How far have you been able to go in terms of looking at water quality, and what further guidance would help you take that further in the designs in terms of looking at uh, managing diffuse pollution and also making sure that we're in a good position for the Water Framework Directive? I think, I think that's quite a good question. It kind of parks on to the, the changes that have happened in the standards as well with uh, water pollution uh, becoming less, um, or not say less important, but less focused on in the, in the standards. Um, it is something that I'm, I'm looking at now as, um, I think the guidance needs to be a bit stronger. I think the thing that's missing is, is um, there's, the, there's the Suds train 
Um, but I think I've, I've seen quite a lot of schemes where people are saying, well, yeah, we've got a swale, we've got a pond, and we've got a bit of permeable paving, so therefore we've got three things in a, a, a management drain. But they're not necessarily actually conveying water from one place to another. They're actually separate. Um, and I, I think in terms of, of guidance, it would be perhaps useful to reinforce that they've got to be in a train for it to work. Um, and not just, oh yeah, we've got 10 different bits of suds on this site, so therefore we've got a train of 10 things. Um, they've got to be interlinked. Um, but I think that there's also, uh, I think uh, it was mentioned right at the beginning about guidance and referring back to guidance before the suds manual. Uh, I think um, C609 is still quite a good um, document. It's a bit ancient, but it's got a lot of background information on water quality, and it's always worth a, a trawl through all 600 pages or whatever it is. Um, Paul, it um, goes back to something I said. If you can get the water out on to ground level and put cascades in, so you oxygenate the water, if you put in your reed beds, if you put in other planting, you're going to improve the water quality all down through the train. But, as Chris has just said, it's got to be a train. I think that's probably covered it. Um, right, uh, just a few things to wrap up. Um, firstly, um, thank you all for coming. And uh, that was a really kind of useful 40 minute discussion around the houses. I hope you found it useful. I certainly did. Um, I did spot that Paul was tweeting in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> so um, for those of you who might want to go and find out what Paul was saying, uh, I don't know whether he was using hashtag suds not duds or something like that. So we're going, we're going to find out what Paul's been uh, commenting on all afternoon. I'm intrigued. Um, on behalf of Syria, um, the Sustrain partners, the Sustrain supporters, um, I'd like to thank the, the five speakers who've given us um, a good trip through two very good examples that show that the future is bright. It can be done from um, the designers, the local authority, the adopters, and the developers' perspective. So if you'd like to join me, and we'll thank them in the usual way.